Welcome to Micro College, a podcast exploring innovative, place based, and humanly scaled responses to the crises in higher education, meaning, and discourse in our time. Everyone knows that colleges and universities are at a breaking point, but what can be done? I'm Jacob Hunt, the director of Thoreau College, a micro college in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Join us each week as we tackle this question head on. Welcome to Micro College. Uh, this is, we're right about a year on into this project, the Micro College Project. And so, um, and if everyone, anyone who's been following along or started at the beginning will know that one of the first interviews we did, really the first set of interviews that we did were with our, a couple of our alumni um, back last summer. Um, and so we are really honored today to have, as sort of an anniversary, a couple of more alumni. Um, really excited to welcome here today, Marielle McGarvey and Brandon Ipina. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having us. By chance, two Houstonians from Houston, Texas, <laughs> <Yeehaw>. <laughs> who both uh, spent that remarkable year of the 2020-21 right in the in the depths of the pandemic here in Viroqua, Wisconsin, helping us to pioneer Thoreau College. So it's really exciting to see you guys and have you back here. Yeah, oh, for sure. Well, it's a pleasure, honestly. Yeah, we are delighted to be back. I think it's just it's just so lovely to be able to visit. <laughs> yeah, so you know, we're you know a couple of years out from then, and uh, I'm I'm excited to catch up with you where you've been and how, also how your experience here uh, at Thoreau College, uh, how it looks in the rear view of, of a couple of years, and um, you've both gone on I think to do things uh, that are you know connected with the Thoreau College project and with micro colleges in general. So yeah, I think you're you're both you have a unique perspective on what we're doing. So, um, but before we get into that, you know, uh, I wonder if you could just talk about. Um, Mari, maybe starting with you, could you could you give a little of your your background and and how did you end up uh, coming here to Thoreau College back in the back in the fall of 2020? Oh yes, one of my one of my favorite stories. Um, I oh gosh, I have always been like very arts oriented, very like creatively oriented person. So I went to a really like intense, competitive but wonderful magnet high school uh, for my high school experience for theater. We did you know like five hours of theater a day, three hours of academics, lots of lots of stuff there, lots of like very interesting materials that I got exposed to that I think would otherwise not be available in like a Texas public education. So I was really, really grateful. I had a really like special experience for high school. And then I went on to college and I go to USC for screenwriting. I am going into my senior year now, but I was a freshman in 2019 and I just was not having a great time. I, I was, you know, very honored to get into this prestigious program, trying out something new, because I didn't really have the resources to explore film and filmmaking in that way in Texas. But even though I was really academically excited, I think internally and socially, I was really unfulfilled by what was going on around me. Um, and I just wasn't really connecting with the place in the way that I had before. Uh, and I sort of just like bludgeoned through my first year because I was like, I, you know, I need to be this writer and I need to be on it and I need to keep working and working because I had always just been in this mentality of like, got to work, got to excel, got to get awards, got to do everything that I can do to advance my creative life but I wasn't paying attention to my personal life at all. And I think, you know, I was suffering for it and the work was suffering for it. And then finally, pandemic comes, forces me to finally like stop mm. and sit, as I'm sure that a lot of people can like really relate to in a way that I had really never stopped and sat in my entire life. Um, and I think I really buckled under that period of isolation and I went a little bit, a little bit cuckoo. <laughs> Uh, and so I had to get out of the house about two months into quarantine, and I met up with a friend from Alabama, and we ended up sort of road tripping, woofing, living in national parks for a month or so, and I started to feel a bit more like a normal, real human being for the first time in a few months, and I liked being outside, and I liked, you know, working with my hands and being in nature, which is n never something that I had like put critical thought into. You know, grew up in the suburbs, then moved to LA. Like I was not exposed to those kinds of environments. But you know, I was working on a goat farm in Oregon for a while. I thought this was this was awesome, 
And it sort of felt like maybe it was the time in my life to pursue this itch a bit more. Um, so I started looking up like farming gap years, farming gap programs, and I found Thoreau through that. And then initially only committed to a semester because I was very intimidated by the idea of a year long program. But as soon as I got here, I think it was much harder for me to leave than it was for me to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <Yes>. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was such a remarkable period of time, I think, for, mm -hmm. for everyone in the world. And uh, yeah, I think that, that the community that formed around this, this place was really was memorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brandon, what about you? Can, what, can you give us a context of where you were? You were you were just coming out of high school at that time. And yeah, yeah. what brought you here? Yeah, I'll say I was honestly maybe 17 when I first learned about the spring I mean uh Thoreau College mm -hmm. uh well I'll say they came both along together uh mm -hmm. Thoreau College came to my head because I always wanted to take a gap year and then also with that fact is well this place was fully uh grounded up with the ideals of let's say Rudolf Steiner Henning David Thoreau and also uh, Ella Nunn the founder of the Springs College and all of these three came together in my life because well, the time of the year, where what was happening, and honestly, all around me, which honestly was like the politics. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the pandemic happening with the, and all the presidential like elections, and honestly, I'll call it like a radicalization of people. Like, um, I honestly felt a dissonance in my heart with how honestly people can are. There's a struggle right now to talk to each other, and. Honestly, I grew up in the city. I, I never thought I would go to the rural area or never had any wish or want. And what, But when I saw this, I, I saw this almost like a perfect chance or like serendipitous chance to, well, honestly, meet people that are completely foreign to me or other um, and maybe come together like humans in heart and maybe something beautiful will come out of it at all. And it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You got turned on to... to Experiential education, these alternative forms of education during high school through engaging with a couple of programs, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. I if we're first started going to a Grand Canyon program, uh, they're supporting, uh, let's say, uh, uh, people that are visually handicapped. And, yeah, trying to figure out, let's say, how to talk to about a land that's so beautiful with, with, with wow. each other and come together and be, honestly, like, intimate in such a place that, it's quite scary. They're scorpions or tarantula hawks, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, after that, it was HMI. Uh, that was a semester school there in Colorado, Leadville. And the High Mountain Institute. High Mountain Institute, correct, yeah. yeah. And there, again, completely foreign to me, on, or maybe everyone in, in my upbringing. Uh, <laughs> I think I keep doing things that are just like, are focusing with the ideas of like, experiential education and honestly, yeah. Uh, Community, or I almost like the republic there. Like I, uh, I, I really do appreciate. Or like I, I've been coming to to see the beauty of like what it means to have like come have yourself out there and see have yourself be bare and actually have your opinions out in in the public, and because that's honestly how you talk to each other and how maybe something beautiful can come out of it. Yeah, I think uh, Dora College was a part for me that where with all the farming, with all the people. Um, Thoreau College, because of the pandemic, I think he had a, a, a fruitful class that was quite diverse, at least in my experience. Uh, yeah, let's say we got Mari there, Gar McGarvey, uh, <laughs> the scriptwriter major, but we also had other people from Stanford or even like just residential, like rural students. And we all, have a, have a, we all had our own beliefs and culture and upbringing. And I, I think seeing all of that just like pushed me into like wanting to do what I want, which is just like honestly hoping to make a this little core in my life of like friends who are doing great and yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned your your family, and I think you know the the context in which you grew up. I mean, this this is probably far outside the the pathways that many people you grew up with have have taken. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder, I'm, I'm curious always, you know, what allows a person to do that? How do you step outside of that, um, that you know, the expected pathway, the common pathway for people in your, in your social context? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I laugh right now just because I, I, uh, my mom has been calling me recently, uh, calling me being quite scared of, for me, um, like having nightmares of, let's uh, say, things happening when I'm partying or she doesn't know what I'm doing, right? And it's scary for her because, let's say, I 
she came to this country for me and I'm honestly maybe her only thing mm -hmm. that she cares about and yeah I'll say there's a lot of people that I know are, that are like that I'll, I'll say under, uh, people from underdeveloped communities but also just people that uh, have family uh, people that love that have people that, they, that love them honestly and so why get out of SA where you're from um, I, I've been talking to a lot of people in Houston and yeah, it's a struggle for them. Or like, yeah, if money is a problem, let's say. Or also like, you're scared of like other cultures. But um, what what I've been loving is being the model or being that person in someone's life. Like they know that they were able to do that. They were able to have maybe a dream and actually able to actualize it. And I think this is it's scary because a lot of people um, feel like they're cornered. Um, and they properly do like uh, they live let's say maybe living p paycheck by paycheck or they haven't been able to have uh, for lack of better words like a, a time of leisure let's say of maybe going to the park or maybe thinking or reflecting because it's, it's hard to reflect honestly with uh, let's say a 9 to 5 lifestyle or when you have other like responsibilities so, yeah. so for all the, like these teenagers or adults that I've been talking to I, I feel like I've been highlighting the fact of like that a education for me has been something of like not having to like force yourself to be smarter but um honestly how to be kinder uh what is for me like uh this kindness is like i say this more smartness i'm trying talking about it comes from like connecting with others and maybe seeing the world from a adjacent perspective maybe just a little bit to the right from what you were but you'll see that the whole world is a little bit different actually especially when you get out and maybe do something different or maybe do a micro college program or a gap year. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I I was teaching as a substitute uh, in Houston for a bit and I was, yeah, there's a lot of students there that had apprehensive, like apprehension for the future for them. Like they don't know what what they're gonna do. And and honestly, when I think it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, I, I think I'm, I was very proud of them to be, for them to be able to say like, I, I'm not sure what I will be doing. And I'm mm -hmm. like, that's fine. Take your time. You're quite young, and I'm still young, and I think that's the beautiful part. It's like, uh, honestly, like, yeah, you're able to do so much. If, um, so try. Yeah. One step at a time, but try. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, you, both of you express in various ways a sense of a, you know, I mean, it's, it's inherent in this idea of a gap, whether it's a gap after high school or during during college or after for a breath, right? And mm -hmm. and it was the way that, that that pandemic year in a weird way gave a lot of people that experience. And we, we still see that in all of our applicants. I mean, everyone, yeah. of course, probably for years down the road is gonna be like, well, and then that event happened, COVID, and, and then I reflected in a different way. Um, and it plays out and people change courses a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, but I think just to take us back to that moment when you guys were coming in here, um, you know, for us uh, planning the program, you know, we had only done a small, like semester program before that, um, of course the question came up: Do we do it? Do we do it at all? Um, and do we do it in person? If we don't, what does that mean? Um, it doesn't seem to make any sense for us to do something not in person because right. it's such an experiential education. And so, therefore, how do we navigate that? Can we bring people from all over? And so, um, we we decided to do it and figure it out on the fly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm really glad that we did because I do think you know it was it was important for our development but i'm wondering if if you could reflect back at that unique moment in history what how did the 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 pandemic play into your decision here and then and how do you think it impacted the the experience um i think the the pandemic like gave at least me like a lot of personal agency where it's like well everything is stopped right now like why should i not spend time on myself and on you know developing a community around me so it, it is, you know, it was really morbid at the time, and obviously, of course, it was a really horrible and devastating time for everyone, but we would kind of find ourselves, like, very frequently being, like, we are so, you know, so lucky and so privileged to be able to have come to this space during this period and to have taken this chance, and I regularly meet people um, at my school that are, you know, now graduated but were in the grade ahead of me, and they're like, oh, my God, I wish I had done that. Like, Zoom was horrible you know that you are you really you really made the right choice and I, I just feel that reinforced constantly with with everything that's happening that it was the exact right thing to do at the time I do think the the practicalities of the pandemic added positives and negatives for everyone like you know as Brandon was saying we have people with 
uh, different backgrounds, different cultures, we had to figure out how are we going to navigate this sort of crisis moment together and you know stay safe and stay healthy, but also address people's wants and needs in, in those capacities. Um, and then also, oh, I don't remember my third point. <laughs> Skip. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, um, with the pandemic, I think that was the first time I was able to actually see people's opinions. Or um, I think is we all have actually our firm beliefs, um, and I let's say I, I was able to reckon with that. Or like a there's moments of like actually like maybe a, a fear or disgust we get from maybe others from their actions. And uh, what I mean by that is though is like in the in the pandemic, uh, there's people that are disagreeing with you and people that are agreeing with you, and so do you. What can you do about that? Is there any way to compromise, or is there any way to actually like have a conversation with those? Um, I was seeing that in Houston a lot, or like let's say like my family, they were working as essential workers, or like construction, or like and like grocery shops, and yeah, having to leave them—that was a whole conversation, right? But then coming here also, and as as the pandemic goes, keep going, and like and the vaccines and all these conversations of like honestly saying, I don't know, but this is happening, and this is what I think we should do, and. Honestly, I'm worried, or we're all worried, and so there's all this like hesitation for to do something. But uh, we all know that our time is, let's say, limited. Our or maybe like we, <laughs> we all know we have family, or we all know we have a dream to do, or like college, or like major. Um, so we know that if we're coming here, we have to make sure that we we make something out of it. And I think that was something beautiful I saw. Or like, uh, even though that's a people do get annoyed or maybe it's just like it's hard to have conversations honestly guys mm -hmm. or like yeah these getting are, to know someone oh, <laughs> these are was, fundamental was, questions of value and like you know beliefs yeah. health and safety life and death kind of issues that high stakes right yeah. that that had to be a, you know real self-governance opportunity mm -hmm. there. yeah, yeah some i think intense some yeah. intense wednesday morning <laughs> meetings there is a there's a phrase that like lingers in my heart for all like so many years now that's just honestly just the idea of like I say having an abundance of heart and mm -hmm. just applying that to your life or applying to it and like every facet of it um how can you just be open and be comfortable and or lenient with let's say all the troubled water that's coming over onto you right now um no I think I think the work college was something that was hard for me honestly uh or it was honestly a lot of it was new for me or unexpected but all that spontaneous, like spontaneous, like things that we were doing, um, honestly made it fun, or maybe it just made it beloved for me. Uh, <laughs> just the idea of like, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, there is a. While the pandemic was happening, we were still having a garden to take care of. We still have work, or things to do um, as a community, and we still, uh, as a Doro College, we still want to be a part of the the larger Viroqua. Um, community, and so we try to do things that we'll try to reach them out and have some people that we'll, hopefully we can connect to, and we were able to do that honestly, which I think I think that was fantastic, and yeah, I don't know many other places that were able to do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that that's the you know one of the differences between students who've done let's say our, our recent semester program here and, and you guys are the amount of things happening in this community <laughs> you know just the connections with the local schools and with yeah. all the community events happening it was you know it was really a low ebb obviously during that time period um, mm -hmm. so it meant that the Thoreau College experience was a bit more like the Deep Springs experience and we should mention Brandon after after being here went off to, to Deep Springs College um, and which is based around isolation, right? Mm -hmm. It's isolated out in a, in a remote place, and here we had sort of a, you know, a bit of an isolation. Not not total, but but it was definitely more isolated than a student coming here now would experience. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> I honestly loved it. I really I really liked sort of just us as a group, as a little little potted unit, kind of having to figure out, you know, how are we going to spend our day to day, like all working together communally, constantly. There was nothing that could pull people in other directions because we were just quite literally stuck <laughs> together. Um, and I think it led to a lot of, you know, a lot of really close, close bonds. And then also a lot of just, I, I loved, you know, figuring out like, how are we going to make our fun today? Like, what are the activities that we can make up for ourselves on the weekend to do? Uh, lots <laughs> of very silly little themed parties and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I say Deep Springs College, uh, the nearest like um, 
community outside of the college is honestly almost an hour uh, away. And so, yeah, we, as a, as a community of like 40 people in the middle of the desert, uh, we get to know each other pretty well. And yeah, I'll say Doro College with the pandemic, we got to know each other. Um, all our <laughs> ways of knowing each other, honestly. <laughs> uh, and, but not just that, right? Is uh, you, you can't just forget. It, it's al- it was almost impossible for us to just be our own little cohort when um, we are still in town. Mm-hmm. And so that was always a question for me. Like, uh, how much how, do I have a responsibility to uh, interact with the community? Like, how as much I as I want to let's say before the pandemic uh but no uh, let's say even in my little walks and saunters into the cemetery they there would be recurring faces and even like in the walks or in little small like interactions i got to know everyone or got to know a lot of people um, there's a joke in my head of like i think i was able to get to most of the um, buildings in Viroqua, uh either <laughs> oh, for yeah. responsibilities or for a, as like a f- family or friendly encounter yeah <laughs> Yes, I and Brandon is a, is a social connector and naturally got to know everyone pretty quickly. <laughs> it's really fun to watch. Yeah. Micro College is recorded in the broadcast studios of WDRT Viroqua, 91.9 FM, Driftless Community Radio on Main Street in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Thanks to Jim and all the folks at WDRT for the support of Thoreau College and the Micro College podcast. So yeah, what other memories do you have from from that year? What what stands out? You know, when you tell people what you were doing at that time, what do you say? And are there, what stories do you tell? Oh my goodness, so many. <laughs> um, I think one one that occurred for me, you know, towards the end of the program, I really loved is not the right word, but I think I got a lot emotionally from the process of like going through the entire life cycle with an animal and like learning more about where our food comes from and like how to sort of sustainably curate what we eat. I think that had been something that I was extremely isolated from prior in my life. So not only just, you know, being here and having the experience of like knowing where everything on my plate is coming from and often having like an active hand in those harvests or in the butchering and whatnot. I, I think that was something that has, you know, since really influenced how I consume post throw. Um, like for a while, until it got to be way too many vegetables, I was doing like community garden boxes <laughs> in LA, doing lots of farmers markets, just trying to figure out like what are the ways that we can continue sort of some of the ideas that you know have been imparted to us from this program. Uh, that was a really big one for me that stuck around. What about you? Yeah, no, um, I, I, like every so often there'll be someone that, that will ask me like, what, what even was Story College to you? And I, I don't think I still know how to even describe it. Or um, <laughs> I think I, there's mixed emotions of like, uh, uh, it was beautiful, it was great. And then it's always like, there's uh, frustrations of like, I'll be tired. I will wake up early to go do my responsibilities. And I, I think all of that comes together to make, to say like, uh, I think Dora College for me was all about having this complete whole education of like this formal, informal responsibilities or uh, education, but also like this reflectory or spiritual one um, that just came from honestly like having that alone time, but also having maybe the quiet time with others too. I think I had a lot of that. And I think it's that's something that people are so interested about. Um, we have a, we have a park nearby called Sidey Hollow that I would say it's like if you enjoy if you go slowly and maybe see something beautiful this is our walden pond yeah it really oh, is absolutely yeah. <laughs> every time i go there i see something new maybe yeah it's so much i i won't, I won't spoil it but uh, there like i've 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 heard people just be screaming i've been hearing i've been hearing people giggle um that would be me. yeah right <laughs> and Sidey hollow screams yeah it's i think that's just, i think that's all what thor college is about me it's just I, I think that was maybe the first time I was able to be myself in the way of like having letting those emotions be out and maybe also feeling like I can rely on others like genuinely or um, yeah we we all have stuff to do and there's people that are interested in what you're doing um, there is this for a good while I was have to, I was doing this internship uh, working in the salami company and a community we. Driftless yeah. provisions. Driftless provisions, correct? Yeah, it's, it's important uh, member of our community, and just 
we just got a bunch of brats from them for recent events. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, um, the, my favorite story to say is uh, about uh, COVID. Um, COVID, our little uh, COVID the So okay, we need to step back and explain to this okay. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So yeah, we we one of the things that ex- that that happened during this year, the 2020 21 years, we we acquired a flock of sheep, um, and but that was preceded by a ram. Um, which had been uh, belonging to my family. And uh, this was the ram was acquired during the spring of 2020. So, of course, it only had one possible name. This was named (laughs) was COVID. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, uh, the 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 conclusion of the year included the the actual execution of COVID, uh, a a slaughter that uh, y'all got to experience. (laughs) Oh, yes. And I, I, you know, like we get to experience it right then. And but it, it was something optional. And what I mean by that, though, is that uh, even though it's something that we're doing and it, it has to happen, let's say, um, people came. People came to see it. People came to help. And I think that's something very, very beautiful for me. Oh, like, uh, there's people out there that grow, uh, grow up like going out there and deer, deer hunting and skinning and doing the solar investigation and all that. And, yeah, I'll, I'll imagine these city folks coming, coming, coming to the rural area <laughs> and helping with making food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was super rewarding. People in my life were disgusted by it. Me too. My grandmother was really, really not pleased with me. She was like, how could you do this? And I was like, no, like you don't understand. He had a great life. We gave him all the agency to you know, be the best ram possible. And this is just the continuation of the cycle. So, yeah, and we all knew this ram. Um, we all knew, it, like we let it, we saw it all growing up. Like there would be group chats of us like sending pictures of the ram, and yeah, I don't know. Like we we we, we weren't taking this as a joke. Like uh, I I'd, I'd done slaughters before, right? And, and so I I almost felt like this was just another like job. But uh, we there are so many of us that are, were there like focused uh, mm-hmm. onto the job and taking this seriously as something like not like it is something quite intimate. Um, and what the way I'll say is like there is a reverence. Like we were all so 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 grateful for the meal that we had that night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it's increasingly one of my my favorite things to do as a teacher is to is to do slaughters, um, yeah. including the chicken butchering, which I understand you've you've brought and taught to other people now how to do chicken <laughs> butchers, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is it is such a powerful experience and it really challenges you to be reverent to be to be you know and, and also just to be in awe of biology of of the natural world that in and you know the way that the animals bodies work and uh and the and the reciprocal relationship between us creatures living on the earth yeah. another thing that um that challenges people sometimes when we talk about things that we do here at Thoreau college are the solos my favorite part of the row. <laughs> so what could you, you yeah maybe you could talk about that just describe for for our listeners what that experience was for you and what you why it was your favorite thing i i am a i am a major solo advocate to the point where now i i still to this day i do my own solo every year on my birthday i will wow. go sleep outside somewhere <laughs> um and like no tech bring a journal I'll at least at least see the sunrise if I can't make it outside this year. Um, I was trapped in a condo, so I couldn't. But I went up to the roof <laughs> at the very least. But I so solos for for people that don't know are when we do 24 to 48 hours out in the woods, all alone, no tech. You can bring a book, you can bring a journal. You've got knife, tarp, a lighter, so you can like can have your fire you can build a little shelter for yourself and then you're just sort of out there kind of surviving and thriving um i think you know for some people it's a really great reflection opportunity for me i always really enjoyed like kind of how automated i became where i was very much about like okay how do i stay warm right now what do i need right now am i hungry right now um and i think that sort of reduction was you know mindfulness in its own way where i just felt very present in my body very present with the landscape i i just i think it's so incredibly valuable and you know when i tell people about the solos especially um i had an opportunity recently to meet a bunch of other alumni of other micro colleges around the country and they were like oh my god what the heck and it's like no i i don't find it scary at all like once you finish the first one i 
think the best advice that I got for like getting through kind of the psychologically difficult part of the solo is that Dave Puig, um, what's what's Dave's? Does Dave have a title within this institution? Well, he's he's basically the creator of this expedition and solo curriculum, okay. um, and he he's you know we've been working with Justice Grenier and people in the podcast can flip back a few episodes and listen to Dave and Justice together talk about the, the whole curriculum. Awesome, good. People should absolutely do that. They're <laughs> both fascinating people. But Dave told us that you are never alone in the woods. And at first that was kind of like a horrifying thought, but then <laughs> as I sort of got more into it, it's like, no, I am, you know, I'm with the animals, I'm with the bugs, I'm with the trees. We're all on the same level here. We're all just trying to get through the night. And that was really comforting. Um, I, I just, gosh, Brandon, what do you think about solos? You're alone, or you should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, um, maybe maybe the right word solitude, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the way I describe it was I, I love it, right? Or I was I feel comfortable being by, my, by myself. But um, I I think I really enjoyed that just because I felt like maybe I no I gone backpacking before, but I, I again I backpacked with others. Um, and this time I was by myself. Um, and it must be back in my little food. Uh, so I felt like that was the first time I was out of civilization or out of society and <laughs> in the lack of a better word like in the state of nature as <laughs> uh, uh, still adjacent to the, our human technologies right um i guess it made me reflect a lot i think that's the beauty of solos um it's it's scary because it's so uh, or it's hard it was hard for me because it's so far away from my everyday life um you know, like we all have our phones, we have the stove top um, to do whatever we want. We we even have microwaves that can reheat food immediately, um, or we know the time. And if we, uh, out there, it, it can get dark pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Especially in December. So Quite, in, before yeah, visa, right. this is the sequence. The first one, you know, we in, in, in the fall when we did this with you guys was you started in in September and it was golden and warm and then we do one in, in November and then the the 48 hour one is is close to the winter solstice so it's the day is short the nights are long it's it's two you know two nights yeah I almost I will say this I don't even remember my my shorter ones my, my I the one I have in my heart is the 48 hour solo one in the cold um, well I, I think it's just because I I, I feel like it has a, has a good amount of time you can you can you can Sheep, you can trick yourself to sleeping as long as you can, maybe let's say up to 18 hours, <laughs> but sooner or later you have to wake up and you'll be out there. And then what? What do you do, right? You, um, well, you're a, you'll be you'll be there with yourself, and the insects, right? Uh, or the <laughs> world. Um, yeah, I think I think for me the thing that impacted me the most was how loud the forest is still in the winter. Um, at least I felt like there was still like sounds, interactions, um, sensory uh, things happening everywhere. I, I felt for like maybe the first time I felt like I was a part of something way bigger than me. And at the end of it, I I wasn't worried. I honestly felt quite comfortable out there, even though it was cold or my toes were cold. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, Mari, you you were after you were here. You went back to USC. Yes, I did. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, you know, um, so for a person who you spent some time there, you came here and did this, and then you went back. How were you different? How were you changed after this experience? Oh my gosh. Um, I think you know that's a very big question, but I think what I really found for myself at Thoreau were like personal values. I had not, I think in my life, just in the way that I had been raised and you know how things had been going, I, I had things that I liked and I knew what I wanted to do with myself, but I hadn't really thought about what are the things on a personal level that I need to be happy myself and to be happy within a community. Um, and I thought about, you know, having a community for the first time and like what it means to be a part of active community building and communal care. And I think that was that was a big takeaway. But Throw really established like a system of values in my life that I will follow to this day. And whenever I, you know, feel myself getting a little bit anxious or antsy, I'm like, oh, 
it's because you are not being as intentional with your life as you know that you should be at this point. Um, so I think, you know, from the micro of like getting a journaling habit and getting a habit towards, you know, caring about what I eat to sort of the larger things of like how I relate and prioritize other people in my life um, in really, really specific ways and, and gift giving and maintaining relationships and all, all of those, you know, wonderful things that come with, with friendships and relationships just had not been sort of, it, it makes me sound so awful prior for the first 18 years of my life, but it just had not been something that was a part of like a really active and active is the word for it actually, active thought process. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And Brandon, as we've mentioned, you went off to another micro college experience at, at Deep Springs. How do you think your experience here shaped that? Or what did you bring that, that maybe people who hadn't had this experience didn't to that experience? Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, going to Deep Springs after Torah College, well, I think the big thing that separated me from other people there was how much experience I have with so much. Um, uh, and, and like I'll say that I also like uh, experience actually being frank or being being open to just being honest or like just talking to someone when even when it, you there's a feeling deep inside you feel like it might not be necessary uh, but just doing it uh, I think Toro College helped me find my my who I what are my strength my strengths and weaknesses um, and what I mean by that though is that um, yeah, when we think of strength weakness, weaknesses, we think of like, um, oh, I think of like a a process of resumes or uh, hiring or jobs. Um, I, we tend to sell ourselves, our, ourselves, and honestly, I I think the past couple of years, I, it's been the first times I, I I felt alive or like I didn't feel like I had a little autonomy that I'm trying to sell myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like let's say when we say we told uh, these these people that are the ones that are usually the employees are asking like why why you why do we maybe want you you think of your strengths right and again you're trying to sell yourself and you sell them to them you curate it but I think um, I was able to see who I am and like what a I I, I, I <laughs> there is I think I was quite frustrated in Thorough College with myself wow, because I was realizing that I overextend myself quite a bit or like um and I think that's the nature of a lot of times of like maybe growing up in the city or growing up with let's say my type of family but um it's just like sometimes you feel like you have to or sometimes you 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 feel like you're forced to right or like no one else is going to do this but um I think Torah College Torah College what, what it taught me most was the idea of leisure um <laughs> we call it sauntering right and then uh, I think Henry, Henry David Thoreau calls it like sucking up the bone marrow of life um <laughs> there's many ways you can say it right but like um when I think of education, uh, I think of being of the whole person, and I th when I when I, when, I, when I when I think of that, I think it means actually like slowing down. And we say that a lot also in COVID, right? But I think actually taking that seriously, like uh, and loving yourself, and hopefully loving others. Um, yeah, no, Thoreau College. What it told me most was here are these skills you can learn, and these are things that we can do, and you can choose, and maybe hopefully you can show that to others. Mm -hmm. And maybe others could actually feel uh, will be impacted by you, and again, you make a little community or like something that's loving around. Yeah, I think you know confidence and agency are also really important words in in thinking about kind of what has been built up in my life because of Thoreau, where it's like I just feel so much more capable and secure in myself because you know we've we've had all these really unique experiencing from doing doing the hard work to build our community and you know do the student governance process and make you know the rules that we want to live by to things like re-roofing the greenhouse and it's like <laughs> I and the solos and everything it's like because I know that I am physically capable of doing the hard work I feel just much more secure in myself and and much more like I know, I know what I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> it can be done. Yeah, it can be done. It can be done. And it's like, oh my God, if I can do it, then like anybody else can. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I think Dora College was a, a big aspect of it all was 
Somehow we got into cooking philosophy. Uh, we have a, we had a mentor named Evan, Evan Edwards. Evan Edwards. Have you had Evan on the podcast? <laughs> no, but actually we should. Yeah. Oh, you need <laughs> yeah. to have Evan on the podcast. Yeah. Um, in in short, right? Uh, the idea of how what it means to like nourish oneself was something that just came keep up going, coming and going um, in conversations, but also just in our little informal like households. Um, again, like. That was this was my first time actually being outside of my family in a way of having to say survive or feed myself, and I don't know. I'll, I'll say it's funny. It's funny how how people um, we eat uh, the the things we want, right? And so that means some people might eat frozen food, or some people might want to cook themselves uh, something huge, or some people will fail in cooking, or maybe are just scared to cook something. Um, you know, and there's convenience in this world, you know. We still have <laughs> gas stations or fast food around. And, <laughs> yeah, I'll the say The barbecue cart, huh? Yeah, oh, my. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, we're going to have to try to find that while we're here. Yeah. In short, um, I think uh, there's this, i grown in this patience of, like, loving to make something with others. Um, these springs, I, I never was able to, to be a main cook there for like a long term, but in weekends I would love to cook with others, um, especially the people that have never cooked before. Um, why? Just because it's not about um, this like teacher and student like um, relationship, but it's more like a, oh my God, we, we can joke around and uh, like, let's not take this ourselves seriously. Like what, like honestly, what do you want to eat? What, what can we make to eat? What, what is it something that we can give to each other after our, our hard work? I know like, um, I, I, I mean, um, I, I almost like, I have this thought every day of like, I, I love this idea of going out to the field, working, and then coming home and having this great dinner that someone has made me, or I made for myself, maybe I made for others. And just having this idea of like this table, and sitting down and eating and laughing. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, I'll say it, like I, I, I ate alone quite a bit growing up and I love eating with others, and maybe that's quite human, but I think people need to try it out more. <laughs> I think, yeah, our our dinners and our meals together are some of my favorite memories, and I think also just has, you know, similar to Brandon, instilled a permanent love of the act of, like, cooking with one another and sharing a meal, but also doing the dishes together, I yeah. think, <laughs> is, is a big one, is a big one. I love it. I have, you know, developed a great love for, for hand-washing dishes from Thoreau, and I think it was always very fun to, after one of our meals in the commons, to all work together to, you know, clean up as well and leave the leave the space better than we found it. And I think that, you know, in bestowed some, some good mentalities on all of us about how to be good stewards of the space that we're in. Right. You can talk about Plato's Republic and, uh, you know, but really it comes down to the to, to washing the dishes when you're building a community, right? <laughs> oh, For yes. sure, yeah. Even You've the philosopher king's got to wash the dishes. The dishes. <laughs> Awesome. So, Mari, Marielle, you and I got to to meet up again recently um, in the context of another kind of follow up you've done to your time here. Um, we were meeting up out in Maine at the Seguinland Institute in Georgetown with um, some other people who actually who have been on the podcast. Um, folks from Outer Coast College, um, Chris from the Maine Local Living School, as well as representatives of Tidelines Institute up in Alaska and Seguinland. Um, so yeah, can you talk about this? Is this is in the context of, of an internship you've done with the Springboard organization? Yes. Yeah, so I have been working with Springboard. Uh, Springboard is an organization that is seeing how we can unite, uh, communally share resources with, and just you know form relationships and connections uh, between ourselves as an organization and a funding body, and with um, all the other micro colleges and you know all around, <laughs> if that makes sense. But I, I've been working with Springboard primarily to set up this conference just with the intention of, you know, having all these different educational programs meet each other and then have conversations around, like, what can we do to both improve our programs, work together on existing problems, and then also, like, how can we ensure the long-term success of this educational movement. Um, and I, I have loved working with Springboard just because I think it's really special to be able to meet programs you know, similar to ours, but with some differences in all parts of the country. Uh, and I think at the conference as well, one of just my favorite parts of that was being able to be with 
other people my age, around my age, that had gone to, you know, Outer Coast and Tidelines and Seguinland Institute, and to sit and be like, okay, what did you do? Here's what I did, and comparing notes all around, and, you know, feeling this instant sense of kinship with these people that I, you know, have just met, but knowing that we come from such similar educational backgrounds and value systems, I think, you know, is a really, really unique experience. Yeah, it was super exciting to be there and also really exciting that you were in that role helping to coordinate it and, and oh, representing <laughs> us <laughs> through a college in that context. I mean, I think, you know, Brandon, as a person coming out of Deep Springs at this moment, um, you know, I, I was came out of Deep Springs about 20 years ago and uh, and really the only person you could talk about that experience with was other Deep Springers, <laughs> right, which is a small number of people and you probably knew them already. But um, to, to be able to encounter people from slightly different but like parallel, very much very shared kind of sets of values represented in, the, in that in that group and some of the other programs you know we've been featuring on the podcast um, it does it feels like it's a it's a special moment it's a it's, a, it's an emergent moment of which people are finding each other and finding having these really rich conversations about what, what education could be like it is I, I I'm glad that springboard exists and I I, I think you know we're we're really on to something uh, in terms of like how do we build connections of these separate but common programs and how do we sort of you know collectively lift each other up to become a more identifiable educational option for students because i think you know as brandon was saying earlier these types of programs are quite intimidating and they do seem pretty inaccessible sometimes financially sometimes personally sometimes culturally so it's like then how do we address these barriers head on and incorporate you know, more people into these programs and grow them and find them in new places or in urban places. Um, and I just think that's so exciting. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where that work goes. Yeah. Um, I wish I went so badly to that. Uh, I, Next year. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the way I was describe it, though, right, is that um, in Deep Springs, we had so many conversations of the Anthropocene or, like, all these things are happening around us, current events, politics, or war even, or like right, or colonization, things like that, that all these activities happen around us. And what can we do, right? How, and the thing is, is like, um, what I learned the most was this idea of political imagination, like um, political in the aspect that, wow, this is not for myself, right? Or like, I, I don't live in this war alone. Uh, we are all together. Or like, <laughs> whether we like or not, we, we are nearby. There's others, and um, what I mean by that though is that uh, I love this idea of like that I, the people are out there coming together uh, from similar aspects of the idea of the micro college that they're seeing that this is a way maybe from coming out of this alienated world and see maybe a solution that's community oriented. Yeah, it's uh, I think there's there there's it's it's a big question of like how can we help each other, how can we serve a, this larger, broader community mm -hmm. of society, right? And yeah, I think we we haven't found the answer yet, but I think we're still going and we're going to keep going. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's super interesting because there's no, you know, real common shared like American identity because, you know, we are a nation built up of many, many different types of people, which is, I think, such a strength, but also one that produces a lot of, you know, tensions and inequity and all of that stuff. But I really love one of the questions that came up during our conference that we talked about a bit was like how can we give American youth a sense of belonging and like looking to those Nordic folk schools and how that sort of arose out of like a positive receptacle of like nationalism and of communal spirit it's like how can we transfer that here and form these communities of people that you know care about one another and are willing to sort of figure out how we can make it work. Because I think, you know, when I look back at my time at Thoreau, one of my favorite, like, and just most beloved aspects of that period was that we were all together, we were all in the space, it was just us, and we had to figure out, no matter the situation, how we were going to make it work. And that was super sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the word, belonging. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I, I always feel like, I'm trying to figure out, like, is there a archetype of of the people that are the ones that will go to these ideal micro colleges, um, and I still haven't figured it out yet. But I think it's it's people that honestly have found like this idea of maybe like getting isolated in, in some aspect of their life, or maybe they want more 
maybe they maybe they are inter, um, inter, enjoying um, devouring like the the scholarly works of people, um, or they love gardening. But I think it, so. W is there actually a common thread with all of that, right? And I'm not sure, but I think belonging is maybe the closest thing I can think of. Also, I think it's the sense of wanting mm -hmm. to maybe come together yeah. or have someone that you can actually like confide in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who, I don't think who's not seeking belonging, right? Exactly. Like, I don't <laughs> think there's one archetype specifically yeah. that should attend a micro college or another sort of communal living type of program. I, I cannot imagine that any person would, you know, be unable to benefit from these. It just depends on how can we then make our programs accessible to other types of groups. Though, like, uh, I was wondering, or maybe I have, like, I have this recurring dream of, like, um, do I remember in, like, some website, maybe in Dora College, of, like, of a, a statement saying, if you've, if you found this place, then you already, this place is calling you, or, like, you already found this place, yeah. so you should probably apply. <laughs> like, uh, there's this yeah. idea, of, though, right, of, like, it, you found it, or it found you, and... I would love to make sure <laughs> that I can make other people find find this experience of like this moment of like, oh my, this is something I actually love, or this is something that I it's so foreign, but it's calling me, it's calling my name, mm -hmm. and I might reach out and reach my hand out and grab something. Yeah, I don't know about maybe this is how you felt about finding Thoreau, but when I found about Deep Springs and like I applied and actually got in, it felt like. Yeah. Feel, I don't know, like Harry Potter. You know, you found that like the the platform number what one and a half, right? Yeah. It's like this, does this really exist actually? And like, how come everyone else doesn't know it, but, but I do? I can see it. Um, so I think uh, something that I'm holding is a sense of you know there's that there is that powerful specialness about each each of these places that as you know it's place space, it's a particular set of people, it's a certain set of activities, it's powerfully unique. Um, but can we imagine a world like Denmark, you know, that the, the Danish folk high schools in which there are, these are all over the place, right? And, and, they, and they are, they, they maintain their uniqueness, their particular, their, their place-based nature, but they are something that, that is really accessible in, in the broadest sense and that they're, 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 you know, they're all over the place. Yeah, and I'll say that again, like, uh, these, um, these macro colleges have a place, or like they... It's not a. It doesn't have the architecture of this prison brutalism that I I I reminisce from high school or middle school maybe even too. Um, these micro colleges have, and what in these places right? Uh, these places aren't just devoid of like, just it's just pure just college right? Uh, I love Dora College because I think there is a it, it really enforces uh, enforces the idea of like the people the town is its own university and. I feel comfortable to actually see each of everyone around me as a scholar on its own of their own work, of their own trade, and maybe being able to reach out for that, right? I, I, I would love to see this world, yeah, and I like to think micro colleges are trying to push this also, of this kind of place where we're not just a resume or that we're not just <laughs> a trade or a major, right? Because we all have hobbies. We all have like little beliefs and things we do on our own. And yeah, I don't know. It's like it's hard to get out there, and but we all have our own things. So what if we all helped it and did it together? Yeah, I think you know that's perfect. Like having attended a traditional university and then also being here, you know, there's definitely that sort of like red brick sort of prestige isolation where you're not you are lucky to be there. You're not a part of it. You're not with it. You're not within a community. You're just in this nice, well-maintained, sort of Disneyland-esque manufactured university space, Ex although that yeah. might just be USC a little bit, not to totally bash them, fight on, I love my school. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, what, what Brandon is getting at, the, the thing that's just so wonderful about Thoreau and about other micro-colleges is it, it, it feels much more like a home, like the physical setting. We are in a town, we are in a house, we are all living together, we're eating together, and in turn, learning from one another. You know, you're attending class and you're learning from the faculty, but also like, 
I've learned so much from all of the people that I have lived with here very specifically. Like the amount of times a day I make coffee and think of you, Brandon, because you <laughs> taught me how to really properly prepare a nice cup of coffee is just infinite. And I have stories like that for every single student within the college and then also members of the wider community as well. It's like everyone has the opportunity to educate one another when we're all sort of on this equal plane rather than an institution that enforces competitiveness and hierarchy and success at the expense of others. And it's just, it's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Brandon, are you gonna say something? Oh, uh, I was, um, when I was thinking about how uh, one bi big aspect of Dora College, right, uh, for me was Maybe the uh, uniqueness of fashion or lack of fashion, uh, <laughs> uh, as in hey. like, uh, there's um, I think a lot of people are focused on how they look and things like that, right? Or like, uh, we there's uh, I, I mean, seeing these trends, right, of like the the, the rise of TikTok. But um, no, what I'm thinking though is that I think through college I was able to explore fashion or explore. Um, who I am, and but there's honestly uh, so many so many people here uh, that are able to that wear whatever they want, you know. And I think we should all do that. And I and I think that's what I want. Like, also in Deep Springs College, like we you know, wear your your muddy boots, wear your flip flops in winter, you know. Like this is your own world. And <laughs> if anything, I say like I I I I love Thorough College because um, we we. We, we, we're forced to get comfortable with each other. Oh, so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and I think just, just the idea of like oh, fashion and laying it bare uh, is still there for me. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, so maybe, maybe as a final question for both of you, um, I think you know, as, as people who are here, some of our, from our earliest uh, alumni and people who especially have gone on in some way to, to really follow up your experience here in very particular ways that are related to the project, um, I'm wondering if you have a, a, a wish or an intention or like a vision you'd like to hold for, for Thoreau College specifically. And you might think of this as a way, like how could we, could we grow or like what would be like the flourishing of something that's already a seed here? Do you have a, a wish or intention for Thoreau College? I think that my greatest wish for Thoreau is, you know, to continue to grow and thrive, but also to be this is my this is my outreach chair, former outreach chair speaking a lot, <laughs> but to continue being really successful in our recruitment process, not only in you know, filling the college with wonderful minds, bodies, and souls, but also finding people from all around the country and beyond, because I know we've had some international students as well, that are willing to embark on this adventure. I think we can find and, and make a home for a lot of different types of people. And I think it'll be really exciting to see the variety of students that, you know, come through here and then go on to do amazing things. And I'm really, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing all of these other people that will be involved in this project. Amen. I, I have so many wishes for this place, um, but I think the the one that I'm trying to figure out which one is the one I want the most, right? But um, I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, no, the the public and private. I I think there is uh, we there's a duty and in, in my heart, right? Um, that I want people to get out of Doro College for, or like to take it uh, when, when you experience Doro College, is maybe learn from it, um, is that honestly, like, uh, it's, it's how to be yourself. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to word, it, word it, right? But like, try, try to feel comfortable doing whatever you want. And so when I, Doro College for me, it was, uh, I say it got, it got quite uh, messy with all the pandemic. Um, and let's say classes, like a lot of times I, uh, classes that were, they were, they'll be happening while I was doing my Islam internship and people would be doing, having other experiences that I, I just couldn't, I, and other people also be experiencing this. And uh, what I want people is to actually make sure they can find a way to make sure that their time here isn't taken for granted. Uh, as in, mm -hmm. I, I feel like my class, uh, we had to feel the gravity of 
maybe like we're coming back to somewhere. Um, we're going back to the the land of the cities uh, and work and yeah and mm -hmm. school for me, right? Um, so enjoy it. Like this, if it, if you're doing it for a gap year, <laughs> like <laughs> um, for lack of better words, like I know so many people uh, that have their own car already, but do have their vices of like let's say be, be on their phones for so long or doing drugs, and sure that you can do that, right? But there's this is maybe the first time and maybe the only place I know of that you can actually that people are willing to talk to you and people are able or you can say good morning to someone in the, in the, while you're walking and they'll say it back and yeah so reach out like just grab you know, grab someone's hand um I don't know as, as no you're, you're so right fall in love <laughs> <laughs> fall in love <laughs> if you come to our college fall in love um with yourself <laughs> or with the land or with people um just fall in love life's too short so, yeah that's always good advice I, I think that's great <laughs> And I, I think so because it's just like uh, I know I know I, I too now know people that are that forget what reality is from from being so into the scholarly works uh, from f like philosophy political theory right you know, and like honest our family and the thing is like I don't know it's something about how you're born into this world and you now you're deciding to take initiative and take a gap year maybe or going forward with a micro college program I think there's something quite beautiful for me of like making something new in your life that maybe it's actually like quite a different road that you could have taken. And I think as is, you won't know if it's bad or good because, but you take it and I think that's exciting. Yeah. But, mm. I think it's, you know, it, it's heartbreaking that you can only have first time experiences once. Yeah. Like being back here in Viroqua, I am just, you know, thinking all the time about all of my memories and, you know, the experiencing of this place and, I think there's a lot of joy in, in the comfort and familiarity, but when I look back on, you know, when I first got here and when I was first seeing all these sites, just the, like, constant, you know, wonder and excitement, that is something that is unique to that, you know, first time of coming here. And I think any any student that makes their way down here just needs to be as present as possible. Like, there's, you know, my one, my one thing that I look back, it's like, oh, I wish I had just been a little bit more present at a few times, but... <sighs> nothing, as Brandon said, nothing can always happen all the time. <laughs> well, we are really honored that you came back to visit, made made the trek out here to, to Viroqua once again, and uh, and thank you for your time for coming on to the podcast, and thanks for being such wonderful representatives uh, of, of Thoreau College out in the world. Oh, thanks, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs>